to the chairman of the Black Panther Party, Brother Seals, Minister of Information, and all these brothers that you see around here who have picked up the gun and said to the biggest cops in Oakland, no more occupation of our community! Our next guest is the UK leader of the new Black Panther Party, which was launched in 1989 in Dallas, Texas. Ten years later, it became home to many former Nation of Islam members when the chairmanship was taken by Khalid Abdul Mohammed. Inspired by grassroots activism of the original movement and the need for unity among Britain's black communities, the group is now taking hold in Britain. Let's welcome the chairman of the new Black Panther Party, Huey Rose, on board HMS Press. How's the mainstream media treating you? Well, they're not treating me bad, but uh, I would say in America we've been getting a lot of attention um, of recent months and years. But we never hear about you in the UK. Is it just that the media are ignoring you? or? Um, well, I'm working with the grassroots community. Um, part of my remit, um, also the international ambassador, so most of my travels are setting up chapters overseas and uh, we're just doing grassroots here and not making too much mention into the media at whatsoever. Why do, you think, why do you think activism of the type we saw of course in the United States, the kind of militancy, isn't something we uh, really think of here in, in Britain except in times of uh, recession in the 1980s say but it didn't seem to be nearly as well organized as it was in the United States. Well, uh, the reason for that is because most of the time in England things have been always suppressed. And so a lot of black organizations have suffered silently until the uprising started within the 80s, obviously starting with uh, uh, the first one in 59 in the Notting Hill uh, section where whites were attacking blacks and killed a black person then. There was uprisings there and then again in the 80s. But since the introduction of crack cocaine and heroin into the black communities, which was funneled by the government, uh, you've seen a, a downpour of or what you call a blank out of activism. So anybody watching this now will be looking at you saying, why is he wearing this paramilitary uniform? You know, should we be afraid? Um, no, um, obviously not. Uh, when people go into the Boy Scouts, they wear a uniform. Uh, when they people go into the uh, TA, they wear a uniform. So um, we wear a uniform to distinguish ourselves from the masses of our people. And our people like to see us and see that we are the vanguards or protectors of the community. And you're combating drugs and, and uh, other negative influences in the black community? Of course, we're combating drugs, we're combating uh, police brutality. Uh, domestic violence and uh, other, other ills within our community. And how do the police react to this sort of uniform? Do they welcome it? Um, I really don't know. Uh, I would say that the, the black officers I've spoken to, they, they've welcomed it. Um, I'm not too sure about the Caucasian officers. Well, what I do know is there are no Boy Scouts. Thank you very <laughs> much for coming on board. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Journalist David Cronin, who writes for many top newspapers, including The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal, The Irish Times, European Voice, and a host of other titles, um, has travelled from his Brussels office today to talk about his latest book on the Middle East. The title is Europe's Alliance with Israel, Aiding the Occupation. David, you begin the whole book by talking about that case that was reported briefly, the uh, stealing of organs from dead Palestinians. Why would you begin a book about Europe's relationship with Israel with that story? Sure. Well, the, the, the reason why I began with that story was because it, it appeared in a Swedish newspaper. Um, let, let me begin in saying that I, um, I didn't think that that, that uh, article was necessarily the best uh, example of um, campaigning or investigative uh, journalism uh, ever written. And the, the issue that I was using was that, that this appeared in a Swedish newspaper. The Israelis went crazy when it appeared, and they asked the Swedish government to punish, basically, or at least, at least um, condemn the author of, uh, uh, of that article. The Swedes um, refused to, to do that, saying, saying quite, quite, 
quite reasonably that they have freedom of expression in, in, in Sweden. But what, what is significant from the point of view of Europe's relations with, is, with, with Israel is that the Swedes were, held the rotating presidency of the European Union at that time. So there was, all this, there was an impression given at that time that there was a major rift between the European Union and, and Israel. But if you actually look at what was happening behind the scenes, there, uh, is no it, rift. there was no rift whatsoever. In fact, um, uh, Israel has been, be, been involved in a, in, in a process over um, many years, at least over the last decade, of um, uh, becoming uh, a member state of the European Union. They are in the Eurovision Song Contest. I'm not sure if that's a punishment or not, but they are also uh, uh, play European football as, a, as opposed to confining their international games to the Middle East. So it, it is an interesting point to, um, to make. I mean, do you think that there'll ever come a day where they apply for membership of the EU? I, I think that's, that's, that's quite possible. Um, Cathy Ashton, the, the current uh, European Union foreign policy chief in the, the, the autumn that it just passed, recommended that Israel should be elevated uh, to the status of a strategic partner for the European Union, which would effectively put it on the same level as the United States and China, major global economies, you know, in terms of how it is prioritised. You also talk about the actual companies, European companies, that are so closely allied with unlawful activities. I think uh, the UN might say, in Israel, uh, in terms of the occupation. Absolutely, I mean, there's a there's a, ra a range of uh, of companies that have worked on, on CRH, for example, the Irish cement company, um, ha uh, has provided some of the cement for that was used in the, the construction of the the wall that was uh, in, in, the, in the West Bank that was declared uh, illegal by the International Court of Justice in 2004, if I'm not mistaken. Veolia, as we know, uh, the French uh, waste disposal and um, transport company, is an, involved in uh, building a light rail um, uh, system in in, in, well, in East. East, East Jerusalem, absolutely. Here. You know, well, they've stepped back from that rail project. They appear to have stepped mm -hmm. back. It's, it, 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 uh, my, the, the latest information I have is that it's um, that they are selling off uh, their shares to Egged, the main um, Israeli bus bus and public transport company. Uh, but that, that there's a competition issue that has to be addressed. But also, you know, um, it should be borne in mind that at an official level, the European Union has been been very keen to uh, increase trade with, 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 with Israel and, 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 and that there's, there's actually been a process set up called the European Union Israel Business Dialogue. Many of the companies involved in, in, in this um, are either arms companies or, or, or have um, activities in, in illegal settlements in, in the West Bank. Well, thank you for coming in. It's a fascinating subject. It's a great book.